So the quick and easy answer is no. Intel has not tried to patent AMD's Zen 1 architecture. But why the hell are we even talking about it in the first place? This is what this video is about. But first, a word from our sponsor. If you want an independent cloud services provider for home servers, VPNs, or clients, consider Linode and sign up today at linode.com slash techtechpotato for a free $100 60-day credit. A recent Gartner Performance Report shows the Node's topology offers almost double the database performance per dollar than other public cloud services. What's your minimum specification? So straight off the bat, I should say, I say patent rather than patent, although because I'm trying to be careful in this video, I'll switch between the two. Some people in the UK say patent. If you have a problem with that, go speak to Tom Scott. He does exactly the same thing and he's much more of a, ling uh, a linguist than I am. So he may be able to tell you why exactly that happens. So if you just by happen to be in the tech sphere of Twitter, you may have seen under Fox 3's tweet in the recent few days, where he presents one of Intel's patents, Intel's patents. In that tweet thread, he goes through saying, Intel's just been issued a new patent in 2022 that was filed in 2018, and there are a lot of diagrams in this patent that are exact copies of AMD's Zen 1 architecture from 2016. And if you go through the tweets, you compare what AMD had in its slides, what even I posted on Anantech on my uh, article over there. It's just a like-for-like -like copy, the amount of uh, schedulers, the back ends, the front end. Even some of the wording in the paragraphs is an almost direct rip of my article from Anantech. Now, the problem we have here is that not many people are versed in what patents do and what patents are, even me. I'm still very much a patent 101 learning exactly what's happening and going on here. But a patent isn't simply just the invention that is trying to be put through the patent, patent law process. You also have to give examples of modern technology in the area. And this is essentially what most of this patent does. It is 122 pages, and at least 112 of those are diagrams and background information to Intel's supposed new invention. It's actually only the bit right at the beginning that it describes exactly what this is meant to do. However, for the rest of the patent, and I'm under the impression it's kind of been written by an intern, uh, because there's a lot of excess information here that doesn't all seem completely relevant to what, what this invention is for. But the bulk of it is just explaining how different, uh, how a modern CPU architecture is built, referencing currently available designs. Now, you may question why would Intel use an AMD architecture in their own patent? And I have no good answer for you there. I fully expect that whoever wrote it uh, went and searched for what is a CPU microarchitecture and found AMD's presentation from Hot Chips, found my explanation of the presentation for Hot Chips, because both are referenced, and just decided to write that out, or at least part of that out in this, in this patent. So I should stress at this point that patents are very hard to digest. They're designed to be dense, succinct, and I wouldn't say they're designed to be hard to read, but they are hard to read. Companies will employ dedicated patent lawyers and patent IP writers to write these articles, or at least edit what somebody else has written for the purpose of the patent. In this case, the engineers behind the new technology will speak to the people writing the patent, explaining what it does. Those people go away, write the patent, and then it goes back to the engineers for validation, for verification. Since this story broke, I've been speaking to engineers in that situation and they've said that they get back the patents of the technology they designed and they don't really understand a word. They don't understand what's going on. So these things are a bit dense. So when I say everybody on Twitter who's not versed in patents before is on that patent 101 course over the course of the week, uh, they're getting a crash course in what exactly patents are. And you know, I'm to a certain extent included in that. What this invention actually does from Intel's perspective, it was simply a way to make a cache line zeroed. So when you're pulling in memory, uh, pulling in data from main memory or from caches, it'll go into cache lines. And when you don't need it anymore, you tell the CPU decodes an instruction 
and says, okay, that's, that's no longer needed. So we're going to mark that cache line invalid. So it can be used. It can be written over. It doesn't need to be kicked out to main memory. That's how it used to go. Now, in the light of Spectre meltdown and side channel attacks to do with caches and memory, the common thing to do now is to actually zero out that cache line. So instead of it just being the data that was in previously but marked invalid, you actually go in and you write full zeros. It's like when you get a new, when you sell on a new hard drive and you want to make sure that the data cannot be pulled out of uh, the ones and zeros. You'll go and you'll write a straight set of zeros to the whole of that data, so it can't be recovered. Same thing with the cache line here. What Intel's uh, invention is meant to do is that it checks. Not only does the core decode the instruction to zero out the cache line in its own core, it tells the interconnect on the rest of the chip to go search to see if that cache line is in any other caches on the chip. Also, issue a fully uh, a zero out that cache line instruction. And then confirm that those cache lines have been zeroed. You may think that this already exists, and if you're familiar with AMD CL0 and ARM has similar instructions, then yes. Yeah. So exactly the exact specific details of why this invention is different to theirs is kind of lost on me, and you need to really be a deep down CPU architect to understand that. However, Intel has gained this patent. Um, and this is actually kind of like a second variation of the patent because you'll also find one which is practically identical but with different claims from a couple of years prior. But what happened on the internet is Underfox posted the tweet thread saying, look at all these diagrams um, of AMD's architecture in Intel's patent. And a lot of people jumped onto that, kind of myself included in the first kind of five seconds, to think, well, that means Intel's patented AMD's architecture. And of course, when you actually go into it and read it, it's a bit more nuanced. However, some media already jumped on this very quickly. I went, I got the, uh, I got the patent word for word, and I tried starting to read it. And uh, I will tell you now, try reading from page one rather than just skipping to the diagrams. Because in this case, it very quickly was obvious to me that most of this patent, like I said, 112 pages at least of it, was simply background and supplementary information of what was already in the market. And it's only those first two, three pages that actually describe what the new invention is. So I went onto Twitter. I, ex I explained that, look, it's incredibly densely written. It's very hard to understand. But if you focus on the first two pages, first two or three pages, it tells you that uh, the invention is this um, cash line zeroing out policy. And I then went onto Reddit and explained the situation there. I put it under the assumption that, hey, this is an intern who's clearly done a summer project on how a CPU architecture is made, and somehow they've decided to shoe it into this patent. Then again, the use of Intel using AMD's architecture. I spoke with Intel um, you know, on background, so not, so not anything I can uh, explicitly talk about word for word what they said. Um, but it's a case in point that this is just common practice in the patent industry. You have to provide examples of what's already available in the market in order to be able to talk about your new invention. And it just so happened that they chose, or the person who wrote it, chose to use an AMD architecture as that example. And it's purely as an example in which it is used. Intel gave an official quote, which I'll put on the screen here, basically saying... This is standard practice, no intention of infringing on anybody's um, uh, patented technology, uh, which is, you know, fair enough. That's kind of what you expect a company to say. And really, it got to a point online where a lot of people, a lot of people still consider companies like Intel, companies like AMD, companies like IBM as just massive, big, singular brain boxes that only ha that have the same thoughts all the way through. They're uniform. Truth be told, Intel and AMD and IBM and Samsung, for example, have multiple business units. And these business units do or do not talk to each other. So there comes a point where not everybody in the company knows exactly what everybody else is doing. If you work at a large company, can you tell me what everybody in that company is doing or what every department in that company is doing, is researching, has put out in their press releases uh, what's public, what's non-public, what's private, what 
patents are being written and how they are being written. Companies that big, yes, do have internal communication, um, whether that's issues or whether it just doesn't happen because it's not even considered that much of a problem. Uh, that's where all of this comes in. And this kind of why I started to become an analyst is because companies are reaching out to me and or engineers at these companies were reaching out to me and saying that they're finding out about their technology through me better than through their internal communications. So that's why, as an analyst, I kind of want to help these companies deal with situations like this. Um, because at some point, somebody's not talking to somebody else, or it's considered not much of an issue until it gets blown up is, uh, into an issue where what has happened has been misconstrued. Now, could it have been handled better? Probably. Could Intel have used its own architecture in those diagrams? Probably. You know, though, th those are other thoughts to have, but the people who I speak to in the communications team probably aren't speaking to those people who make those decisions just because that's too many, you know, communication points away in the rest of the company. So is this probably going to happen again? Well, I just said probably, and it probably will. Um, will other companies use other companies' architecture in their patents? Yeah, they probably will. Um, it's funny, though, at the end of all of this, Under Fox uh, then posted on Twitter saying, look, I posted this tweet thread in a very certain way uh, to help a friend who was doing sort of information travel theory with relation to social media and how quickly information propagates if context isn't provided. Under Fox said that he could, um, he or she, or they could have stated that the patent was about something else, but decided to leave that information out just to see how the information was propagated. Some people don't believe that as a genuine excuse uh, for what Under Fox did. Um, I'm, I'm just going to take Under Fox at face value and say, well, if that's an exercise in how information is propagated on social media, then that's probably a pretty good fun one. Um, it just shows that if there is misinformation out there based on what you're reading do you take the time to do the research or understand what's going on before the information hits you such that when you see it you can digest it in the right way i did the hard work but it took 30 to 60 minutes to get to that point where i fully understood what was going on myself before i could translate it to the rest of the world is everybody going to do that no and this is where science communication or just communication of points in general, especially technical points and nuanced points, is a big issue in both the media and in social media based on what you share or what you choose not to share. So let me leave you with that interesting thought. Do you take everything at face value, information that you may, may know already or that you may not know? And how do you even know where the nuances are if you're not even aware, the nuances exist. If you like this content, please don't forget to like and subscribe. We also have now a private Discord server. And if you want access to that, become a Patreon member and it'll instantly add you as long as your emails are linked. You can join the Patreon for as little as $1.50 a month and it all goes back into helping the channel. Thank you for your support.